Hello, everyone. Today, we're talking about understanding human consciousness. What is human consciousness? What is the purpose of human consciousness? And we'll be talking about a few luminaries as well, intellectual luminaries like uh, Richard Dawkins, who came up with the extended phenotype. Um, so that's like a, a beaver's dam, his uh, extended phenotype of the beaver. Albert Einstein, who came up with special relativity. Marcel Grossman, who helped him out with the maths. Um, in 1905, and then added in gravity to make general relativity, 1915. And also we'll talk about the Reverend Thomas Robert Malthus, um, who wrote a book and an essay on population and the perils of population food supply. And, um, and then there's a few others as well that we'll mention, Paul Dirac and Brian Green. And... Richard Dawkins recently, well, it was last year, actually, 2024, he gave a talk in America mediated by Michael Shermer. So that's the one to look on his podcast, The Poetry of Reality, if you're interested. So the question is, what is the hard problem of consciousness? What is consciousness? Why? I mean, we understand the brain to some extent, not perfectly, but to some extent. Why do we understand the brain cognition and some behavior quite well, quite well, not perfectly, but quite well. And yet we don't understand why consciousness has this subjective experience quality to it. And uh, some people call that qualia. Now, I can answer this. It's a point that I've been interested in for quite a long time. Essentially, human consciousness, the sort of subjective experience, is natural selection's answer to gravity. So gravity is one of the four forces, along with electromagnetism, the strong and weak nuclear force, and it's what makes up the uh, entire universe of uh, matter and energy. And But gravity is always attractive. Gravity is unforgiving. Let's put it that way. So how do biological organisms deal with gravity? Well, Richard Dawkins points out that some single-cell organisms and, and small life forms are quite robotic in their movements. And he is right about that. That's a fair comment. And they can afford to be robotic. Single-celled organisms or small organisms can afford to be robotic because they're, they're on the ground and their relationship with gravity is very simple. The gravity holds them to the ground. Okay? The relationship is, is not much greater than that. It is, but it's not much greater than that. They're connected with the ground. Gravity's connecting them and they're moving very little. However, human beings, are former tetrapods, all right? So you've got four legs. Now we've got two. We stand up on our hind legs, so we're bipedal, right? And some people think there's reasons why we did that, maybe a sexual display. But we now have these two things called arms with hands on the end, So, and we don't use them as feet. So that puts our head much further from the ground. Okay, and human consciousness, as a thing from the consciousness of a horse or another animal that's close to the ground, the human consciousness is far more aware because of it. Okay, and the same goes for a bird. And the fact that we're that our human consciousness is based on the ground, we don't have wings, so we don't fly around, means that we have to be very mindful of predators on the ground and animal predators. Okay, and also gravity itself is a predator as well. It can pull you down to the ground if you overbalance and hurt your head. So human consciousness and the subjective human experience is basically natural selection's way of letting you deal with gravity on your hind legs, which is not easy. We have massive inputs, eyes, ears, nose, touch, taste, the five senses that help us, and it provides vast amounts of information to the to the nervous system and brain, and as a result, we can compute all of that consciousness and hopefully we don't fall over too much. So if you want a, a full statement, basically what you'd say is human consciousness has evolved through natural selection to deal with gravity. The consciousness, which doesn't just happen in your brain, it's your whole body, but mainly the brain. The human consciousness drives emotions and feelings. And the purpose of those feelings and emotions is to promote and increase brain activity to protect your body, to make decisions that then protect your body. So the purpose of human consciousness is an evolution, as an evolutionary principle from natural selection that is designed to protect you. So human consciousness, consciousness protects you from, is designed to protect you from predators by driving feelings. The, the consciousness drives feelings and emotions in the body, 
which are biochemical, basically. And those feelings are to assist and promote brain activity so you don't forget things. You actually have a feeling that keeps going, especially negative emotions, to basically deal with predators, whether it be animals or some other kind of misadventure or gravity itself. So not just animal predators, but risks to the body, okay? And it's very important because we stand up on our hind legs and therefore we have to be more conscious because there's more gravity to deal with. We're less stable on two legs than on four, okay? And therefore we need more consciousness. So this brings up another issue, which is where does gravity sit with natural selection? Well, you could say that basically gravity is uh, natural selection or natural selection is, is generated by gravity and the other three forces operating on a biological organism. It's, you know, if you want an organism to work, in gravity, then you, you it must engage in natural selection, perfects or adapts over time to deal with those four forces because we can't get rid of those four forces as humans. Therefore, our bodies and that of animals must evolve, must adapt um, as part of it. And that would neatly explain the non-random concept of natural selection because it is non-random it's basically based on the main fundamental force which is gravity obviously you've got electromagnetics in there and strong and weak nuclear force but gravity is a key one obviously charles darwin said that it may be said that natural selection is ever scrutinizing and this is paraphrasing him and perfecting through adaptation in a non-random way the organism and that that i mean that's a good way to describe it but that's basically the best way to describe natural selection because unfortunately and this is a problem i brought up before whereas albert einstein added gravity into his 1905 theory of special relativity and to come up with general relativity no one's really combined gravity properly isolated it and then shown how it gets added into natural selection to explain the non-random natural selection evolution principle and really you do need to combine gravity in there to explain and to show how it all works in my opinion now one of the reasons i bring this up as apart from the fact that gravity was the missing link to put into special relativity to make general relativity is also it also feeds nicely back to human consciousness albert einstein's principle of special relativity tells us that time is personal so you can have two watches set to the same time and then you put them on different people and then they move about in space. And then ultimately the watches disagree, even though they started at the same time and people were walking around on the same planet. So we exist in our own personal time shift. And that also, that concept, uh, even though gravity isn't a part of special relativity, except in a simple way, I suppose, um, in relation to time, that, that explains why our experiences are subjective. Well, because we experience time as a very personal thing therefore we disagree on things because we disagree on the time because of special relativity uh, and that gives that helps give us a subjective uh, texture and feel to our experience or qualia so the physics does help us there not just with gravity but special relativity and the personal nature of time as shown by the theory of special relativity from 1905, Albert Einstein came up with, and Paul Dirac combined special relativity and quantum mechanics. It was the later theory of general relativity that they haven't managed to marry up with quantum mechanics yet, hence theoretical concepts like string theory. Now, um, I think this is a, a good way to understand human consciousness and also natural selection and gravity and special relativity's relationship on one or all of them. But it's interesting to note that... <laughs> Um, Charles Darwin and his friend Wallace had both read the Reverend Thomas Robert Malthus. Uh, that's Malthus with an M-A-L-T-H-U-S, Malthus, who um, at the age of about 32, I think, published his book on population and uh, you know, food scarcity because people would populate faster than food would be grown, this sort of thing. And he also wrote an essay on it as well. And he was a Reverend, he was a member of the church, and apparently Darwin read his book for humor, according to Dawkins. And Wallace had read Malthus, and in the middle of a brief point of lucidity during a malarial fever session, he came up with a concept that geometric progression explained natural selection, or some 
some good um, explanation there. And that helped Darwin and Wallace tumble to it. Natural selection, that is. So look, that is quite interesting. Look, this does come up in Polymath Thinking, which is the name of our channel, of course. And I should explain, Malthus was writing that right at the end of the Little Ice Age. So the Little Ice Age went from 1115 AD 1850 and there was a lot of extra poverty hunger around the french wouldn't eat potatoes even though their king tried to encourage them to do so so that you know that helped lead to the french revolution um you had the maunder minimum about 100 years before that supposedly had helped stradivarius of cremona make his uh, string instruments that are fantastic to this day but the point is that Malthus, Reverend Thomas Robert Malthus, was probably more negative than he should have been because of the weather. And yes, I've done it. As an Englishman, I've spoken about the weather. But I'm afraid um, uh, you must understand that we English talk about the weather for a reason. It's incredibly important and it's incredibly um, ever present to all of us, like gravity and natural selection. And at least people are now agreeing with us Englishmen on that and everyone's talking about the weather when you consider discussion of climate change um, but it just shows how even though Reverend Malthus's work was a bit silly when it comes to saying that uh, human reproduction would always outstrip food production the reality is there was reasons for that that we can explain through polymath thinking the little ice age and um, his work with the geometric progression behind it did help Darwin and Wallace to come up with the concept of natural selection explaining evolution. Anyway, Brian Green talks about this as well, and I encourage you to look at his work, his books, but also have a look at what Dawkins has to say with Michael Shermer and have a bit of a read of Albert Einstein as well. And hopefully um, that helps explain human consciousness and natural selection, gravity, and a whole range of other things. Tell me what you think. Please subscribe, like the channel, and leave us a comment, and look forward to hearing from you.